With us today, we have Dr. Sander Vanderlinden, Professor of Social Psychology at the University of Cambridge and Director of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab. He's also one of the foremost researchers in building resistance to persuasion through psychological inoculation. Dr. Vanderlinden, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, pleasure to uh, be here. In your latest book, Foolproof, Why Misinformation Infects Our Minds and How to Build Immunity, you explore the prospect of building psychological herd immunity to propaganda and misinformation. Can you discuss what herd immunity is in this context? Yeah, so if you think about the idea of a psychological vaccine, right, that you expose people to a weakened or inactivated strain of a piece of misinformation or the techniques that are used to produce misinformation and people can build up cognitive resistance over time, then you have individual immunity. And if you look at some of the literature that goes back to the 60s, from a social psychologist named Bill McGuire, um, he never really, he was very much thinking of this at the cognitive level that, you, oh, you can pre-expose people to a weakened dose of a propaganda sort of technique and then inoculate them uh, beforehand. But I think it was only much later that people started thinking about what isn't the ultimate purpose of this metaphor uh, to achieve herd immunity, just like you do with real vaccines, right? The, the whole idea is to get enough people vaccinated um, so that the virus no longer has a chance to spread. And I think that's where we want to go with, uh, with herd immunity. Uh, and psychological herd immunity, I think, can mean multiple things in this context. Um, I think it's a bit ambitious to say that at a global population scale, um, when 90% of the, you know, the, the population is vaccinated against propaganda techniques, then we're going to have herd immunity against misinformation. I think that's perhaps a bit optimistic, but you can think of this in terms of communities, whether online or offline, that if enough critical mass in a given community structure is vaccinated at a certain level, then there might be enough resistance to slow the spread of, uh, of misinformation or disinformation. And that's, I think, what, what we mean with psychological herd immunity. Um, and some colleagues like uh, Josh Compton, who's at Dartmouth, um, uh, worked on the idea of uh, uh, word of mouth. And so people could spread the vaccine maybe by word of mouth. The way we've been thinking about doing it is um, uh, through, um, you know, entertaining games or videos or conversations that, uh, that people have. But the idea here is that, um, that you actually pass it on. I think initially in, in the literature, people thought that... Um, What's, what sometimes they refer to as post-inoculation talk, which is the idea that people have conversations about the inoculation, uh, was very much focused on the fact that it would actually strengthen the resistance within the individual. So if you're inoculated and you're talking about what you've been inoculated against, you're strengthening your own resistance. The way we were thinking about it, though, is, is the passing on process. And so if, if you're passing it on to other people, uh, how much do other people remember? And how much does the next person remember and the next person? And how does it spread within a network or community? And that's kind of the, the herd immunity that, that I'm thinking about. And we've done some computer simulations to, to see what's what's possible. So this is theoretical, theoretical of course, but let's say you have a, a, a structure of some social network, then you have broadcasters of misinformation, and then you inoculate people. And there's different scenarios of how you can inoculate the population. You could disperse it over time slowly. You could load it up front. And, over the course of the simulations, what we found over hundreds of simulations is that inoculation helps anyway, but but it's not as effective if, if it's kind of a, a, a drip that's go, going slowly sort of throughout the population. It's going to be most effective when you heavily vaccinate people up front in advance of a massive disinformation campaign. It kind of makes intuitive sense, but that's also what the models show. And then how do you do this in practice? So that's what we've been focusing on is, is trying to partner up with some uh, organizations that can really scale this and and get the vaccine out to as many people as possible on social media. And that's been the focus of some of our uh, later work. You explain how trying to debug misinformation can often create a stronger memory association with the misinformation in question. How can we get around this? Yeah, I should caveat this a little bit by saying that, you know, there's a lot of talk about fact checking, debunking, backfiring, and, and it's important to, to sort of distinguish the different forms of, of backfire that can happen here. I think one of the things that people have been worried about for a long time is the, 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 the worldview or political backfire effect that, you know, oh, if you say something, people are, say something that's not politically congenial, if the fact check is not politically congenial people will dig their heels in deeper and so on. And, uh, you know, it seems that there's 
that's true for some extremely motivated people, but but it seems that overall it's not a huge concern for most people. That you know, most people when they're exposed to a fact check, they may disregard it, but actually doubling down on their beliefs that's a that's an extreme response so you actually don't see that in 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 most people only people who are extreme um however another type of backfire effect is this idea that when you repeat the misinformation you can inadvertently uh, strengthen people's associations with it and that's something i've been slightly more um intrigued by because it has it has this sort of practical element that how are you going to debunk something without repeating it um, and that kind of intrigued me. And, and the classical finding for this is that when you tell people, they give people a story in the lab usually about some event, there was a fire and uh, or an airplane crashed and this was the cause. And then later they say, oh, actually, that wasn't the cause. The cause was unknown or this is the actual cause. And then they ask people a bunch of questions about, oh, why did this happen? How did the plane crash? Or what started the fire? And then you notice people are still giving you the wrong explanation that they heard the first time and they disregard the correction that you gave them in between. And that's what we call the, the continued influence of misinformation. And that happens because people, are so, people either fail to integrate the... So if you look at some neurological research on this, there's not much, but there's a few studies and they have competing accounts. So one is uh, about integration. So people fail to integrate the correction in their mental model of how something works. And this is a, a, an integration error and it has to do with, with memory. You know, your memory is a spider network of, uh, you know, it's kind of like a social network, right? You have links and nodes. Nodes are the concept. So let's say vaccine, and then you have live vaccine, inactivated, uh, autism, um, side effects, uh, uh, immunity. And there are all kinds of links and all related to each other. And the more often you repeat something, the stronger these links become and the easier they are to activate. Uh, but then when you're trying to undo a link, that's where it becomes really difficult. Because when you undo one link, you may not realize that there's 30 other ones that are still active. And it be kind of becomes this game of whack-a-mole uh, where you're trying to undo all of these links. And people are forming new links all the time. And when you repeat information, it can, it can strengthen them. Um, another competing account is what we call the selective uh, retrieval account, which is that um, when people are exposed to a correction they have to concurrently so the the misinformation and the correction are are stored concurrently in your memory so people activate them and the idea is that the misinformation is being suppressed by the correction but sometimes there's an error there and people uh, fail to suppress the misinformation and so there's a retrieval error the people not retrieving the, the correction um anyway long story but i think for me the the, the Regardless of who's 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 right about these accounts, um, I think both are probably true, and they can happen both uh, and differently for for for, for different people. Uh, I think the moral of the story is the the old saying, you know, when a jury hears something in a trial that in the media they weren't supposed to hear, you know, you can't unring a bell. Um, and I think that's the same is true for for debunking, and that comes to the practical recommendation, which is your question. This was a long winded way of actually answering your question. Uh, which is you need to make the correction as prominent as possible relative to the misinformation. Because re regardless of people fail to integrate or fail to retrieve it, it's, it's all happening because the correction is not prominent enough. So we need to stop repeating the misinformation and make the correction uh, the headline and the salient part of it. Um, now, my colleagues, some of my colleagues will have a slightly different opinion we, we just did a consensus report for the American Psychological Association trying to hash this out. And I think I think I may I compromised on the idea that it's it's probably OK to repeat non influential parts of the misinformation once when you're doing an extensive debunking of it. But it shouldn't really be much more than that. And you should try to wrap it really in the truth. And so this is what also is called the truth sandwich, which is you start with the facts and then you you explain why the myth is misleading rather than repeating it maybe. And then you end again with the facts. Um, and so you layer, you kind of protect the truth. Uh, you use the truth uh, really to wrap it uh, around uh, a lie. And that's the, that's the truth sandwich so that it doesn't escape. That's, the, that's kind of the idea. Um, now, experimental evidence for this is still evolving, but I think it's kind of a foolproof way of doing this. If you start and end with the, um, with the facts, uh, it's very hard for the misinformation to escape. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the recommendation. 
Can you explain how cognitive dissonance may incline people to unconsciously reject accurate information? Yeah. So, so what's interesting is um, Leon Festinger, who was one of the original psychologists who studied uh, cognitive dissonance, had this great example in, um, in, in this book that he wrote in the 60s, that he infiltrated this cult. And um, there were a, a kind of a semi-religious cult, um, and they were convinced that aliens were going to come down to visit Earth uh, and and um, um, kind of declare the apocalypse. And they had a whole movement that revolved around this. And Fessinger kind of predicted that, um, well, he had some hypotheses. He was like, well, they, ha they have a set date by which this is supposed to happen. So let's infiltrate this cult and let's do a little pre-post experiment to see what happens with people's beliefs once the key date, ha you know. But he asked, well, what's going to happen with people? Uh, when they notice that the aliens are not coming. And so he thought, well, they must be changing their beliefs, right? So now they're confronted with a piece of evidence which contradicts their prior beliefs that have been preparing all this time. They believed in something. Now it's not happening. So they must be changing their, their beliefs. But that's not actually what he found. So when, when the date actually came and went and they noticed that the aliens, they were all gathering around outside and they noticed that there were no aliens coming down, they actually doubled down on their beliefs. So they created a new kind of pathway that um, actually what was happening is that the aliens were giving them a second chance to save the earth. And so the whole, you know, they just went in a slightly different direction. And so he hypothesized that what's happening here is that people feel this intense uh, dissonance when they're being confronted with information that doesn't jive with what they already believe. And so either people will have to spend a lot of effort trying to now change their beliefs and their identity and everything that's wrapped up in it, or they could just selectively expose themselves to information that agrees with what they want to believe uh, and reject the information that uh, they're, they're confronted with. And so I think this idea of, of, of cognitive dissonance is that when people are, are confronted with information uh, that challenges their core beliefs, that's uncomfortable, that produces dissonance. And so people are more likely uh, to, to reject that. Uh, and accept information that furthers what they already want to believe. Um, and so I think that, you know, when you take that example into the political sphere, you see that all the time, that, you know, we, we people people believe in things that, uh, that, that seem like statements that would reinforce the, the, the party line or their worldview or their spiritual beliefs or whatever it may be. And if they come across information that challenges that, um, people are more likely... Uh, to want to exclude that information from their diet and seek out information that confirms what they want to believe to avoid that dissonance. What would the ideal design of a social media platform look like in relation to stopping the spread of dis and misinformation? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, if I had a good answer to that, I, I'd probably be making a lot of money trying to sell this to, uh, to, uh, to a social media company to, uh, to better the world. But um, I do, you know, we had a conversation with, with, with Meta a while ago uh, and, and Instagram, and uh, that was really interesting. So they, they said, okay, you guys are always saying we shouldn't maximize for engagement, but what should our algorithms be doing then? Um, and that's kind of the question, like, okay, what, you know, we were, you know, I brought my whole lab down to the, the Meta headquarters here in, in, uh, in London, where I'm based. Uh, and um, it's a tough question. So they said, okay, listen, so um yeah we understand that if you maximize for engagement um misinformation might be more likely to go viral but you know what um one one interesting one interesting insight they had was like but a lot of our stuff is based on people's behavior so people tell us what they want so we look at people's behavior um and uh and that's that's what goes into it you know people if people are yelling at each other if they're posting misinformation if other people are liking it um if that produces engagement, that's what people are, are doing. That's what our what their behavior is telling us. But then we also talked about how people's behavior in the moment isn't always representative of what people really want. So if you look at survey data and you ask people, they say, "I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to waste my time in an echo chamber. I don't, I don't want to be exposed to, to hateful content, disinformation. Um, people don't want that stuff." If you ask them, um, and what's so interesting is, um, is when they serve up, survey people on these platforms and ping them about their experience, you know, after they've been yelling at someone for 20 hours or something like that, um, they actually report that they don't, they don't like it. So they've been, their behavior is saying one thing, but then people reflect and say, actually, I don't want that. Um, and I think it's easy for people to get wrapped up in these things online 
So how do you how do you change that? So one suggestion we had was like, well, can't you optimize for educational content, accurate content, you know, motivate accuracy? And uh, you know, even within my group, somebody said, well, I mean, that's nice in theory, but who's going to make money uh, out of uh, optimizing educational content, right? No, you know, that that nobody. You know, nobody's going to watch that uh, um, all day long and uh, people are going to opt out of that. And then there's no social media platform because there's only a small percentage of the population that wants to watch educational videos all day. Um, and so I think, you know, that's, you know, that's a fair point. So what do you what do you do then? So another idea was, well, the algorithm could have um, more signals. So you could you could use that survey data and, and use that as inputs for the algorithm, actually, to calibrate it according to what people prefer, what they say they prefer, not just their their passive behavior but here is another idea what if you give people credibility and trustworthiness ratings on their accounts so if you're um if you're an account that produces a lot of unreliable content then you get downgraded uh, and this just creates a reputational incentive actually um, for people to stop sharing misinformation uh, because you don't you don't want to be downgraded it's it's like your uh, your your uber rating right you don't uh, somebody, somebody told me this lady. I think it was uh, a colleague who said he was he was taking a um, uh, a ride share, and the guy started talking about vaccine conspiracies and uh, and uh, and um, you know that the government's all behind it, and and also um, you know get, gargling with lemon is going to fix everything. And he said, you know what, you know I do this, I debunk stuff for a living, but I'm not going to say anything here because I want to keep my Uber rating. And so and, and so I think you know there 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 is something something to this that. You know, people want to protect their reputation, um, even sometimes uh, uh, to, to avoid conflict. Uh, and so giving people these credibility ratings to, to accounts, I think, could, could be uh, useful. Uh, another idea is really to, um, that's related, is to use filters for, for polarizing rhetoric or uh, toxic content. Um, of course, the questions they have for us is, like, well, who determines what's polarizing? Who determines what's toxic? Um, and I actually think at a basic level, there are things there there are very simple things that you define as polarizing rhetoric that are not political like if you use they words more or we words more we signals our group they signals our group there are ways that you could actually create these filters that are not that objectionable toxic content i think we can all agree that that name calling and and, and trolling and all of these things are um are, are toxic um of course they said well okay if you make it optional, most people who engage in this behavior are not going to turn on that filter. Um, so there, there are a lot of practical challenges in how you would actually do this. But some ideas were, you know, creating filters for toxic or polarizing content, uh, using credibility ratings on accounts that discourage the sharing of, of misinformation and hence promote the sharing of, of accurate information. Um, um, maybe getting rid of the ad model. Um, that's a huge problem. But then you get initiatives like uh, asking people to pay eight dollars for a blue tick, right? Uh, if you uh, and so you know, there's there's been a lot of uh, people don't want to pay for social media, really. Uh, and so that's 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 another factor. If they're not going to have ads and engagement, then how, how are they going to make money? Um, and so I think there is a solution, um, but it's definitely not going to be uh, an easy uh, an easy one. Of course, in theoretical terms, the easy answer is incentivize uh, ac for accuracy, uh, which is also what what I wrote about in the book. And some ways to do that are are leveraging reputational concerns, using filters, uh, down ranking unreliable uh, content. Um, here's something more controversial. There are research studies that show that deplatforming super spreaders uh, really works wonderfully in uh, reducing uh, uh, content, which you know. There are big differences in Europe and the United States about how uncomfortable people are about the platforming and, and limiting speech. Um, personally, uh, I think there are side effects. Um, so I do think that if you if you looked at the deplatforming uh, of Trump, for example, misinformation on Twitter did did go down. I mean, research uh, studies show that. But then he sets up his own social network. Uh, and now you have a whole group of people who, who are perhaps more radical than they would have been if they had stayed on Twitter. Um, so is deplatforming the ultimate uh, uh, solution? It's um, it's not an it's not an easy answer, um, and so I think a lot of people want to protect freedom of speech and use softer measures. Um, but I think at the end of the day, regulation obviously is going to play a role in holding social media uh, accountable. Um, but yeah, you can say a lot, you know, fines, but you know, uh, they pay the fines, right? Uh, Germany has a law uh, against uh, against this sort of stuff, and they they just pay the fines because uh, it's nothing to them. Um, and so, um, 
um, what, what kind of regulation uh, would facilitate a better social media. I will say, when, when I first learned about social media when I was younger, I thought it was a great idea, uh, connecting people all around the world. Right? There's, there's, I think there is huge potential in social media. We've just now gone down a path that's, that's not at all, I think, what people had hoped for. Maybe what, what even the creators had, uh, had in mind, and, uh, and we need a better model. So that's, that's for sure. I'm, I'll stop talking there because I'm, you know, I'm, I don't have the ultimate answer, but, but just some ideas. Okay, it looks like we're out of time for today. We've been talking to Dr. Sander van der Linden, Director of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab at the University of Cambridge and author of Foolproof, Why Misinformation Infects Our Minds and How to Build Immunity. Dr. van der Linden, thanks so much for joining us today and we do hope to see you again soon. Uh, perfect, yeah, I look forward to it. And uh, thanks again, very nice meeting you all.